On this day, a hundred nine years ago, in the dead of night, President Woodrow Wilson brought the hammer down on the American people and the world by initiating the Federal Reserve. But did you know that 14 years earlier, one of the biggest, most astounding strikes happened in New York City? And this strike shut down the city and was led by a bunch of eight, nine, and 10 year old children. But before we go any further, you know what to do. Please hit that subscribe button and give us a like. As always, such a very, very special thank you to all of our patrons and our producers here on Esoteric Atlanta. Without you guys, our channel would not be possible. You guys are what make my research happen. And from the bottom of my heart, I thank you all. Welcome to Esoteric Atlanta. Of course, my name is Bryce, and on this very special date of December 23rd, 2022, we are going to be talking about the Newsy Strike of 1899. Now, before we get into the story, once again, I do want to acknowledge that they are building a high rise right beside my building. And so if you hear any banging around, that is coming from outside. But today I kind of find it quite appropriate because we are going to be talking about street kids, street kids in New York City, of course. Now, here's the thing. Here's the thing about this story. It's like once you see it, you can't unsee it. The government, the controllers, the people in charge have done such a good job of indoctrinating us into believing a certain timeline that anything that is contrary to that timeline is often hard to accept, even if the truth is literally right in front of your face. Now, for me, as most of you guys know, I am a huge lover of history. History was a subject that I always did really well in. I never had to study. I just remembered it because I always loved hearing the stories, the stories of people, especially being an American and believing for many generations, believing that our ancestors came over to this country from another country to have a new life, a new religious freedom. I, I was obsessed with it. I wanted to know everything. I wanted to know what it was like to sit in a boat for all those weeks, to, to be from Northern Europe and then land in a place like Charleston, South Carolina or New Orleans, Louisiana, where my heritage lies and, and to be in swampland from, from somewhere that was really cold. Like what, what did those people go through? What were their stories? Or a couple of my ancestors that came along later. One did come through Ellis Island and was from New York. Another ended up in Philadelphia. Philadelphia. But of course, as I was growing up, those were my Yankee ancestors, so we didn't learn much about them. But then when we were confronted, or when I rather was confronted with this, this new idea, not so new of an idea, technically and actually a, a, a pretty old idea, of this time period called Tartaria. Now the Cassiopeians will tell you that yes, a thousand years has been added to our timeline that never existed, and the, the true history is actually a lot faster goes through the timeline a lot faster than we were taught. But what I found remarkable with this new evidence of Tartaria means that nothing that I was taught or you were taught about our history is true. And when I was in Connecticut this summer, I, I bought a textbook in an antique shop. It was $20. I couldn't open it until I bought it, but I, I bought this textbook from the 1800s. It was a grammar school textbook. And inside, it said that the Native Americans were of all races. Some were white, some were black, some were Asian. And as we've learned as of late, some were even blue. So that, that kind of blew out the theory of white man bad and white man's a conqueror if there were already white people here. And then with Tartaria, 
were shown that the likelihood of all these old buildings, like the buildings of Washington, D.C., all the cathedrals and churches, were probably not built by people who rode a horse and buggy and had no electric tools. No, these were remains of a prior civilization. And of course, in the Tartarian studies, we see that there's evidence of a worldwide mud flood. As even the town I grew up in discovered in their old historic buildings, that there were actually floors beneath what they thought was the first floor, showing that something had happened. Something swept through not just Europe, not just Africa, not just, just Asia, but also the continent of America. And then we got to the incubator babies. In our study of the true history of our Earth, the incubator babies is what really got me. A gut punch, like no gut punch I had ever experienced before. Of course, from the incubator babies, we lead into the concept of orphan trains. We look at how all of a sudden, in the 1800s, coming into the 1900s, our world was overrun with children. Children who had no parents. Children who were allegedly orphaned. Now, the controllers will tell you this is because during the Victorian age, and yes, through one line of my family, I am Queen Victoria's, one of her five times great-grandchildren, not something I'm super proud of, but that is true. I am one of her descendants. There are many. But the Victorian age was one that was considered to be a very conservative age. And so the controllers will tell you that we had these orphans because when women would get knocked up outside of wedlock, they would give their baby away to a workhouse, a factory, or an orphanage in order to then be able to have a life. This was sold to us as some selfless act. Of course, the mother giving up her child in hopes that the child will be adopted. And so therefore, the child can have a life and she can have a life because if she had kept the child, no respectable man would have married her. And so therefore, her and the child would both be destitute. But the thing is, is that the math doesn't add up. How do we have so many work, workhouses, factories, streaming full of hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of children? It's not mathematically possible for all of these children to have been orphaned by their mothers. So where did these orphans come from? Is it possible that there was a mud flood? That took out Tartaria. And then just like in the Apocryphon of John, one of the missing books of the Bible, again, Apocryphon means secret teaching or secret message. Is it possible then as the, at the start of Gog and Magog, the controllers, the Luciferians, were granted access to the DNA of the dead bodies from Tartaria, where they were, were then able to start to manipulate our DNA and grow our ancestors on this timeline in incubators. Is it possible that this is where all these orphans came from? Now, I have no way of proving this is true or not, but once you see the reality of the situation with all these children, you can't deny that something doesn't add up. Now, of course, again, everyone will play it off. Well, maybe there wasn't as many orphanages as we think there was, but that is simply not true because when we look at the Newsy strike of 1899, that then rolled into the child or children's strike of 1899, the New York City itself was shut down because the laborers, the children, refused to work. Now, if you look at mainstream media articles or mainstream media references to the Newsy strike or the children's strike of 1899, they will tell you that a lot of these children were children of immigrants and that after school, you know, after school, they would go and sell newspapers to try to raise money for their family. But if you actually go through the archives, they mention nothing about these children having parents. In fact, in all the archived articles, archived references of this particular strike, it labels the children as orphans and street kids. 
It talks about how most of these children were able to hawk newspapers in the freezing New York winters without so much as a jacket. And then when we look at the gravity again of all the other children who decided to strike with the Newsies and the fact that it shut down the whole down, damn city of New York, you start to see that at this time of 1899, at the turn of the century, the whole city of New York was run off of child labor. And I guarantee you, New York was not the only city running off of child labor. Cities all around the world that were now owned by the controllers in Gog and Magog were using child labor as slave labor to run their towns. So this is my theory, especially after studying the Apocryphon of John, especially after now me understanding that the history we've been taught is not true. My theory is that the controllers created children, put them on the streets, put them in factories, made them slaves. But one thing that the controllers underestimated was the power of the spirit. They could have very well manipulated our DNA. We know our ancestors were giants compared to us. We know that our ancestors had, had all 12 DNA strands active, or we only have two. We know that our ancestors understood communication with other terrestrial beings, where we still speculate that as conspiracy. But what they cannot control, the one thing that this group cannot do is create a soul, create the fire of spirit. And this is what I believe became apparent in the ch children's strike of 1899. Children created, in my opinion, to be slaves, to breed more slaves, to move into a negative timeline, stood up and said no. They were so forceful with their demands that eventually the controllers had to take the knee. And that is why I believe 14 years later, on December 23rd of 1913, in the darkness of night, the Federal Reserve Act was brought into the United States and then subsequently the world. Because if they could not control us through DNA manipulation, then they had to start to control us through mind control. We know that the Federal Reserve is not just a bank. The Federal Reserve also controls our educational systems. And we know now that our schooling is a joke, that nothing we are taught is true. Before the Federal Reserve was signed into act, most of the children that worked on the streets, the street children, the factory children, they weren't educated. The, the government wasn't concerned about them going to school. But then all of a sudden, after the Federal Reserve was signed into our lives, the government started to creating child labor laws. Over time, these evolved, and now it is actually illegal, especially in the United States, for your child not to be in school, not to be indoctrinated. Again, if they can't control our body through DNA manipulation, they can then try to control our mind. And once the mind is convinced of something, the spirit becomes docile. But let's go ahead and look at the evidence of my theory from the children's strike of 1899. The child's strike of 1899 was a youth-led campaign against Joseph Pulitzer and William Randolph Hearst that lasted from July 18th to August 2nd, 1899. Now, at the turn of the century, newspapers were delivered twice a day. And I, I actually checked this out because I, I kind of, when I saw that, I kind of was taken back. Like, I remember getting the newspaper as a child when they would throw it in down your driveway. I don't know how many people actually get the newspaper anymore. But from my recollection, we only got it once a day. And so I asked around with a few of my friends. I was like, hey. I mean, we're older, right? If, if you're in your 20s watching this, you probably don't remember having newspapers delivered to your house, but I'll be 40 in, in, in a, a little bit over a month's time. So I remember this. I remember the newspaper. And I was certain that it was only once a day. And so I asked around with a couple of my friends and they said, yeah, yeah, it was only, it was only once a day. But this time it was twice a day. So the story goes, as the controllers tell us, that the Pulitzer and Hearst, the two big, 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 in my opinion, totally Lucy families, Luciferian families, 
would release the news first in the morning. And the morning newspaper, according to what they say, allegedly was delivered to subscribers' houses, just kind of like our newspaper was dropped in our driveway. But in the afternoon, for the afternoon edition, they would hawk the papers to children so that the children could then hawk them on the streets. These kids were, of course, called newsies. This is where we get the term extra, extra, read all about it. These kids were also, in my opinion, and I know some other researchers kind of said this too, but I, I thought the same thing. These kids were the original kids who thought up clickbait. What is clickbait? It's something I actually try not to do on my channel, but I know a lot of people do it. Clickbait is putting a sensational title on your video so that someone will click on your video. Okay, and so they would do the same thing. They would look at the newspaper, find the, the, the headline, and they would exaggerate it to try to get someone to buy their paper. Now, the way it was done is that the newspaper would, would sell 100 papers to a person for 50 cents. Now, of course, 50 cents back in 1899 was obviously a lot more than 50 cents today. But then the newsy, the newsy kids would turn around and sell each newspaper for a penny a pop. And so they would double their profit if they sold all of their papers. Now, again, it is said that at this time, the newsies were responsible for the afternoon edition. And from what I understand, according to my research, the afternoon editions were often the most scandalous and sens sensationalized editions. It's, I guess it was kind of like our page six edition. Day, right you know like or our our um tabloid sensational papers and and so they would do that according to the mainstream after school yeah right as the guy says in the tartarian video yeah right because in other archived evidence these kids weren't in school and they were getting up early in the morning collecting their papers and hawking papers all day long just to be able to survive and we're going to get into this too a little bit later in this episode because we know that the controllers always have to tell us the truth and they tell us the truth through media so we're going to talk about the truth through media a little bit later on now in 1898 we did have the spanish american war allegedly not so sure of anything anymore. And at that point, Pulitzer, Joseph Pulitzer, did up his prices from 50 cents to, for 100 papers to 60 cents for 100 papers. So the newsies were spending 10 more cents on the same product to then sell. But at that point, it didn't seem to be that big of a deal because there was a war. They were able to really hawk those papers. People were interested. Again, this was a time before TV. I, I believe this was before radio. I'm sure it was before radio, too. So, so the newspaper was really the only source of entertainment or the only source of understanding what was going out on outside of their own little communities and neighborhoods, which we know that those who control the news control basically the world. But in July of 1899, Pulitzer decided that he was going to pull the same thing. He wanted to make more money, even more money than he already had. And so he upped the Newsies price again from 50 cents to 60 cents per 100 papers. At this point, there was nothing really big going on in the world to cause the rise in price. And so the Newsies basically said, fuck you. And they created their own little strike against Pulitzer. And William Hearst. So I'm going to tell you, I have been to the Hearst Mansion in California. And again, I love history. I love going and seeing old buildings. But that was the strangest exhibit I've ever been in in my life. The William Hearst house. Fucking hell, it was so strange. The tour guide was obsessed with William Hearst and would make very strange comments about the women of like the 1920s. It was just very silent film stars. It was just very strange. Um, and so I will, I will always, always remember William Hearst because that was literally the most bizarre thing I've ever experienced in my life. But it, the strike was against Hearst and Pulitzer. Of course, Hearst and Pulitzer pushed back. Who are these little kids to tell them how they were going to sell their papers? Pulitzer even told his journalists that they could not write about the situation with the children. History doesn't, history repeats itself a lot, doesn't it? And we know that the media today will not tell you certain things that you need to know. And so I thought that was kind of comical that they're still pulling the same tricks today. But that didn't matter because the strength and the power of these kids would eventually grow to overcome the might of the big Pulitzer and Hearst. Things 
started to get really interesting again on July 18th of 1899 in Long Island City in the borough of Queens. A group of newsboys turned over a distribution wagon of both Pulitzer's The World and Hearst The Journal. The newsies in Manhattan and Brooklyn to other boroughs followed suit the next day. So yes, this was the time of carriages and horses. And so these groups of children would basically run up to the wagon and push it over in retaliation to the big guys of Joseph Pulitzer and William Hearst. And in fact, in the beginning of the strike, the newsboys got pretty violent. Anybody caught selling the boycotted newspapers were basically beaten up and mobbed by a group of like eight-year-olds. The newspaper owners got so paranoid that they actually hired full-grown men to be newsies and promise them police p protection. But these eight, nine, 10, 11 year old kids were so clever that they would distract the police and then attack the grown man. As the strike grew on and on and on and no mention of it was coming through any newspapers or any journalists, the newsboys decided to take matters into their own hand by creating flyers and putting flyers up all over the city. This is what got other children interested. All the children who are working in factories and slaughterhouses all started to understand what was actually going on, that their fellow children out in the streets of New York decided to push back against their own controllers and so the other children started to push back as well. Pretty soon, the whole city of New York would come to a screeching halt. Because of these flyers, many of the just regular citizens around New York started to also support the children. Because again, even if we are genetically modified by the controllers for this timeline, we still have the spark of life. We still have a moral accomplice. We still have empathy and compassion. And so many of the people who were blessed to not be street children took pity and started to understand the strife that these children were under. The kids decided that they would actually form their own union. And, and once more, I'm going to reiterate, these are like eight, nine, ten-year-old children. In the movie Newsies and in the play, which we're going to talk about, they show these kids as being like 16, 17 years old. And in the, in the play, there's a funny joke in the, the beginning of the Tony Awards well, where Neil, Neil Patrick Hare, Harris talks about a group of 35-year-olds playing 15-year-olds in the Broadway play. But in reality, once again, I, I want everybody to understand this. These were children who were like eight, nine, ten years old. These eight, nine, ten year old children were responsible for feeding themselves, for taking care of themselves, for trying to provide a roof over them, their, their heads for themselves. They did not have parents. They clung to each other as each other's own family. And at eight years old, they were creating a union and pushing back against these powerful men. Like, how incredible is that? I, I want people to really take that in. My nephew is 10 and i love my nephew to death and he is so freaking smart but i don't know if he would know how to do this and fortunately for my nephew he lives in a beautiful home he has a great family he has his own bedroom he has a cupboard full a pantry full of food he and his sisters have a playroom and then he has a room that's specifically just for his video games. He's got a backyard with a trampoline. So there would be no need for Charlie, my nephew, to even have to worry about something like this. As an eight-year-old, nine, ten-year-old, he shouldn't be worried about something like this. And, and the realization that these children should have been eating milk and cookies at night instead of chain smoking and fighting Joseph Pulitzer is really unnerving. But also, again, makes me as a human being living in this timeline is super proud of where we come from. Now, when they created their union, of course, they did not create their union in the way unions are created today. And I do think that union started off is a really good thing and then they just got inverted by the controllers to be kind of bad things but the kid who was the strike leader was a kid named kid blink i guess this is what happens when you name yourself kid blink 
The union president was a kid named David Simmons. And they decided that they were going to create just because they said so. They didn't have any paperwork, anything to fill out. They just said, no, we're a fucking union because we say so. And hey, hey, you guys, you guys hawking these papers. No, we're not going to pay you more for your paper. Absolutely not. If that means we have to starve for a couple of days, we're going to do it because you can't take advantage of us. On July 24th of 1899, the Newsboys held a citywide rally at Irving Hall. Now, Irving Hall sat on the corner of Irving Place and 15th Street in Union Square of Manhattan. It was built in 1888, so 11 years before the strike, and it had been a German language theater, a Yiddish theater, and a burlesque house. Now, this is interesting because we see this burlesque house in both the movie from 1992 of Newsies and the Broadway musical. And in both the movie and the Broadway musical, these kids are very familiar with the burlesque house. In fact, it seems that the women in the burlesque house were kind of the people who took care of the kids. Even though they were scandalous women of the night, they were the ones that seemed to provide these children with some sense of a mother. The rally was actually sponsored by a state senator named Timothy D. Sullivan. He was known as Big Feller, Big Tim, due to his size. And he was kind of an interesting guy. Like what I read on him, he kind of seems to be very scandalous himself. And so he kind of hopped on this children's strike bandwagon and gave them kind of the, the manpower the kids need to really get their message across. And in this one th theater on this one night, five thousand boys from manhattan showed up and two thousand from brooklyn at the rally many of the local businessmen who supported the children spoke and at the end of the rally david simmons the union president gave a speech where he listed the demands that they wanted from pulitzer and hearst i also found a list of other kids who spoke at this rally and i just have to read off their names because they're fantastic and it just goes to show you that these kids were definitely street kids. They were not orphans. These are definitely names that a child would name his or herself. We had Workhorse Brennan, Bob the Indian, Racetrack Higgins, who was the Brooklyn leader, who was also a character in uh, both the movie and the Broadway play. We had Hungry Joe Keenan, and he actually ended the rally in a song I imagine it's kind of like a pub song because, again, this is 1899. They also had a couple of girls, little girls, who were also involved in the Newsy strike. And, and I thought it was interesting when I was reading about their strategies when they were trying to kind of control the situation and, and take down people who were selling their boycotted newspapers they had this rule where they didn't touch girls like girls were kind of taken care of girls were protected and i thought oh that's so sweet like these late nine ten year old boys were actually looking out for for the girls as well they even had a parade planned for july 26th of 1899 they had some like marching bands and stuff i thought it was so cute and they had like six thousand boys that were planning on being a part of this parade but mm -hmm. Alas, they didn't have a permit, so I couldn't do their parade. I, I'm kind of shocked that they didn't just do the parade anyway, because kind of seems like that was their, the way they lived. They just did what they wanted anyway, which fair play to them. Now, on August 1 of 1899, there was a compromise made. Pulitzer and Hearst finally decided to give in to the demands of the kids. The whole Again, the whole city of New York had shut down. So what were the controllers supposed to do? They didn't have their slaves anymore. They didn't have their little workhorses out there on the streets or in the factories. And so they had to give in. And so they made a compromise where they told the newsboys they would keep the price at 60 cents per 100 papers. But the kicker was if the newsboys could not sell all of their papers in one day, the paper would buy the paper back. Before this, if the newsboys bought 100 papers and could not sell them all, then they had to just eat the difference. They couldn't sell the paper back to the publisher. At this point, they could. And so the kids were happy with that, and they made their amends, and then all of a sudden the union was disbanded once, um, once they got what they wanted. Now, I really want to put the point across, too, that these kids, not just the newsies, but a lot of the factory kids that worked in slaughterhouses and 
regular factory seamstress. These were very dangerous conditions. It's horrifying to think that these young children would be doing that in in our world. Like we have such a different perspective on children, especially those of us who are good and who have a soul and who have a moral compass. We would never put a child in this type of situation. Now in the movie of the Newsies with Christian Bale from 1992, Bill Pullman is an actor who plays someone named Brian Dent, who is a journalist who kind of goes up against Pulitzer and Hearst and helps the Newsies get their story out. In the Broadway play, that character is replaced with a female character named Catherine Plummer. Plummer, though, is her pseudonym because she's trying to be a journalist. In the play, they're also picking up on the fact that women were also at this time fighting and continued to fight for equal rights. And so they picked up on Catherine Plummer being the journalist who helps the newsboys get their story out there. But again, Plummer is a pseudonym because her real name is Catherine Pulitzer. And in the Broadway play, Catherine Pulitzer, the daughter of Joseph Pulitzer, along with the son of William Hearst, turn on their own families to help the newsboys seek justice. Now, this didn't really happen. None of, from what I, my research, none of the children of these big men and news, the newspaper turned on their fathers and helped these street kids get their way. But I thought it was interesting that in the Disney run movie and play, they're telling you that there are whistleblowers. And I've said that before. We can't judge people by their last names or who their family is because each individual person has their own free will choices to make. I thought that was just so interesting in the Broadway play that they would show the son of William Hurst and the daughter of Joseph Pulitzer working with these children to help them. Now, again, yes, you heard me right. Disney is the company that took the Newsboys story from the strike of 1899 and created a movie in 1992 and, of course, a Broadway play, Tony Award-winning Broadway play in 2012. Once again, the controllers always tell you the truth. Even though the mainstream articles talk about these kids just being poor immigrant children, and like I said, the older archived articles said, no, they were street children, we see the truth in the lyrics in this music. The lyrics of the song Carrying the Banner go as follows. Ain't it a fine life carrying the banner through it all? A mighty fine life carrying the banner, tough and tall. Every morning goes where we wishes. We's as free as fishes, sure beats washing dishes. What a fine life carrying the banner home free all. It takes a smile as sweet as butter, the kind the ladies can't resist. It takes an orphan with a stutter who ain't afraid to use his fist. So let's look, Disney wrote this, an orphan with a stutter. They're not immigrant children who are just doing a part-time job to help help their families out, their street kids. Summer stinks, winter's waiting, welcome to New York. Boy, boy, ain't nature fascinating. When you gotta walk, still it's a fine life carrying the banner with your chums. A mighty fine line life carrying the banner with your chums. Blowing every nickel as it comes. A mighty fine life blowing every nickel as it comes. I, I'm no snoozer. Sitting makes me antsy. I like living chancy. Harlem to Del Delancey. What a fine life carrying the banner through the slums. Bless children. So this is where the nuns come in trying to feed the street children because they would do that. The church would send people out to try to feed these street kids. Bless children. Though you wonder lost and depraved. Jesus love you. You shall be saved. Let's go down here. And I'll say anything I have to because it's two for a penny. If it takes too many weasels, just make a meet after. Look, they put up a headline. What does it say? That won't pay. I got better stories. So where's your spot from the copper on the beat? God, it's hot. I was going to start with 20. We'll tell, well, will you tell me, but a dozen will be plenty. How am I going to make ends meet? 
So that's children at wondering how they're going to make ends meet. We need, we need a good assassination. We need an earthquake or a war. How about a crooked politician? Hey, stupid. That ain't news no more. Uptown to Grand Central Station, down to City Hall, we improves our circulation. Walk until we fall. Still, we'll be out there. Look, they're putting up the headlines. They call that a headline? Carrying the banner man to man. The idiot who wrote it must be working for the sun. We'll be out there. Did you hear about the fire? Heard it killed old man McGuire. Soaking all the suckers that we can. Heard the toll was even higher. Why do I miss all the fun? See the headlines. Hitched it on a trolley. Newsies on a mission. Kill the competition. Sell the next edition. While we're out there carrying the banner. It's a fine life carrying the banner through it all. A mighty fine life carrying the better banner tough and tall. See the headline. All right. So they're telling you these are orphans who are doing whatever they have to do to make a penny to be able to buy food. They're taking food from the, the, the nuns, the Salvation Army. They again, a lot of these old archived articles talked about how these children didn't even have jackets on in the freezing cold. We look here and the world will know another song. Pulitzer may own the world, but he don't own us. Pulitzer may own the world but he don't own us. Now the world was what Pulitzer's newspaper was called. But you notice here in the lyrics, they didn't capitalize the world. So if they were referring to the actual newspaper, it would be capitalized. So what are they telling us here? Pulitzer may own the world. The controllers own the world, but they don't own us. Pulitzer may own the world, but they don't own us. Pulitzer may crack the whip, but he won't whip us. Pulitzer may crap the whip, but he won't whip us. And the world will know we'll be keeping score. Either they give us our rights or we give them war. Either they give us our rights or we give them war. We've been down too long. We paid our dues. And the things we do today will be tomorrow's news. And the die is cast and the torch is passed. And the roar will rise from the streets below and our ranks will grow and grow and grow. And so the world will find, will feel the fire and finally know Pulitzer may own the world, but he don't own us. All right. Let's look at the, the lyrics to seize the day. Open the gates and seize the day. Don't be afraid and don't delay. Nothing can break us. No one can make us give our rights away. Arise and seize the day. I have chill bumps reading this, guys. Chill bumps. Now is the time to seize the day. Send out the call and join the fray. Wrongs will be righted if we're united. What did the military back channel say? Divided we fall. United we stand. United in our own countries. United as country to country, us against them, just like the Newsies. Wrongs will be righted if we're united. Let's seize the day. Friends of the friendless, seize the day. Raise up the torch and light the way. Proud and defiant, we slay the giant. Let us seize the day. Neighbor to neighbor, father to son, all for one and all. All for one and all for one. Open the gates. All for all. One for all, and that's it. One for all and all for one. Open the gates and seize the day. Don't be afraid and don't delay. Nothing can break us. No one can make us give our rights away. Neighbor to neighbor, father to son. One for all and all for one. So very telling in those lyrics. Very telling of what the truth was, in my opinion. Now, if you're still kind of new to this idea of incubator babies or um, basically our history not being what we think it is, I'll leave you with some more statistics. From 1854 to 1929, a half a million orphans resettled under the orphan train movement. This goal was to get orphans off the street of New York City. Again, these were called the orphan trains. They took kids, threw them on trains, and sent them out to the Midwest to populate the Midwest. In the 19th century, so the 1800s, the Institute of Children, Poverty, and Homelessness said that in 1870s, 20 to 30,000 30, kids lived on the streets of New York City. 
They try to create something called homes for the friendliness, which were basically asylums. We see this homes for friendliness in both the movie and the play. They were asylums where they took the children and threw them in these basically jail cells. So once again, were these poor immigrant children who had a home to go to every night? No, they weren't. They were street children. 90% of the children who were put in these asylums did not survive them. And this, I thought, was even more fascinating. In 1864, at the Mulberry Street Police Station, a room was set up called Lost Children's Room. This also became known as the Sky Parlor. Now, in many readings, it said this was basically kind of a lost and found for children. They would collect these children off the streets and then they would bring them to the police station where they would kind of lay on metal beds and wait for maybe their parents to come get them. But that's not what that was. In other articles I found, this was an astrocity. They would collect these children and bring them to the Sky Parlor at the police station. Full-grown adults, a little bit like the incubator babies, would come in and basically just watch them, almost like they were a freak show, like these adults had never seen a child before. You could also apparently go child shopping at this police station. Now, once again, I, I know that this is hard for a lot of people to take in. And I did put a call out and asked if anybody was a descendant of any of these children who participated in the, in the children's strike. And I didn't get any responses, I don't think. I might have got one that got lost in the email. But it was interesting to me because this was such a huge thing that happened. Of course, there would be descendants alive today of these children. And I, I thought I started thinking about the orphan trains as well. I don't, I don't know many people who are claiming to be descendants of, of these orphan trains. Now, we know that the World's Fair and a lot of these other great big fairs were also set up as re-education camps. So what if, and Americans, I'm specifically talking to you, what if your ancestors did not come over on boats? What if that is a story that was taught to your closer ancestors, like your few generations back at these world fairs, so they wouldn't know that they were descendants of incubators. If you really think about it, especially for the Americans or Canadians or Australians, our um, alleged ancestors did not emigrate over here that long ago. We should have some pretty definite resources to know about these people. But so many people are kind of unsure of some things. That's why 23andMe and Ancestry.com got so big is because people are like, I'm not 100% not sure. I hear they're German or French or English, but I'm not 100% not, not sure. So let me take my DNA test so I can see. But what if your ancestors were these children? What if your ancestors were these kids who fought back? To me, that is a much greater more fantastic story than a bunch of people coming over on a boat. And again, this wasn't just happening in America. These incubator babies, these children were placed all over the world. And you see, here's the thing. Yes, they signed in the Federal Reserve quickly after that. And, and they started working on the, the Federal Reserve almost immediately after this catastrophe happened with the pushing back of the children to start to, to brainwash us so we wouldn't do this again. But if these children are, are our ancestors, the fire that ran through them at eight, nine, ten years old is the same fire that runs through you today. And the world will know wrongs will be righted if we're united. These children were willing to give up eating for a few days to win their rights back. Can we do the same? Can we take the energy of our true ancestors, the fire that was lit in them and channel it in our timeline today? Because over a hundred years later, we are in the fight for our lives and we are fighting against the same people that they too 
or fighting against. Their spirit lives in us. Let's make them proud. This story makes me very emotional. I would highly suggest watching the musical. I will put a link to it down in the description box below. I will put a link to some of the songs. And again, even though the movie and the musical use older people to play like 15, 16, 17 year olds, I, I do want you guys to remember that these were 8, 9, 10, 11 year old kids. They're our ancestors. Let's make them proud. With that being said, I hope that you guys are preparing for a very Merry Christmas. Of course, I want to hear your thoughts and your opinions down in the description box below. I will try to place the like seven hour Tartaria documentary down there too. So you can watch that as well. If it will stay up, I'm actually shocked it's still up on YouTube. But so if you get there and it's gone, YouTube took it down. Um, but I would love to hear your opinions on this. Is I, I, I would love to for you to sit down and watch the musical and research this for yourself and tell me what you think because this is phenomenal and the truth has been right in front of our faces the whole time the whole time through newsies through the movie newsies through all this information the truth has been right there in front of us and it's time for us to take our story back now tonight or this evening, rather, from 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, we will be having a Christmas party over Zoom. Stephanie Schaap from Great um, from Spiritual Perspectives of Our Great Awakening is actually hosting it. The link to that Christmas party will be down in the description box as well. If you're watching this after the 23rd, obviously the party's over. I hope you had a very wonderful Christmas Eve Eve <laughs> and I hope that you guys are gearing up for a wonderful holiday with your friends and family once again there will also be a link to the new yoga intensive that is starting on January 22nd as well as information in the link on how to book private lessons with me all right you guys I hope you have a wonderful safe holiday this channel will be going dark until Tuesday, December 27th in observance of the holiday. So once again, from my house to your house, I hope that you have a very, very, very happy Christmas. Happy Christmas Eve. Happy Christmas Day. And enjoy the day after Christmas again with your friends and family. Love you all. We're all in this together. We got this. And I'll talk to you all soon. Bye.